This is a video of the game Never Call Retreat from uh, the Wargamer magazine number 25. Um, it's about the first day of Gettysburg, July the 1st, 1863. I don't know when it was printed because I found it difficult to find any, any uh, date in the magazine. But anyway, we know it's old. So um, this is the size of the map, it's uh, four A4 sheets or four uh, times the size of the magazine. So I think that's letter, what they call letter size, isn't it? Um, uh, the rules are in the middle and uh, you just get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages of rules advert on the back. Um, it's very, um, very clear rules. Uh, it's mainly the same things that the sort of usual things we're used to. So, um, for example, you have um, combat rating uh, and a morale rating on the counters. Maybe I'll go a bit closer for that. So, combat rating and then morale rating. The unusual thing is, sorry about my dirty nails. <laughs> the unusual thing is that. Um, Movement's not on the counters, and that is 20 movement points for every counter except for cavalry, which move 28 movement points. Now that um, tells us one of the interesting things, sorry, I don't have autofocus on this phone. Um, that tells us one of the interesting things about this game straight away. Um, I'm doing this um, video for anybody who's got the game and has never played it and is wondering what it's like, might consider getting it out, or anyone who's looking at it and is wondering, what, uh, for sale, someone's wondering whether they, it might be something they would like to play. Um, so, you standard hex encounter, you've got zones of control, um, you've got a standard type of units, you have uh, artillery, infantry and cavalry. Um, there's no commanders, there's no command and control like that. Um, you have line of sight, which is um, oops, sorry, which is a very simple, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and you have the terrain, um, and then so that's standard. You have um, an hour per turn. It starts at seven a.m., finishes on the eight p.m. turn. You see here the end of the seven p.m. turn, where I called this game um, uh, the uh, there's. Um, Get the town of Gettysburg here, um, Cemetery Ridge here, and it's been um, breastworked by uh, the Union. They have artillery here, some infantry units here, smattering of infantry left here, and apart from that, lots of losses. The uh, Confederates have lost a lot of units as well, but it um, ended with a Confederate victory. They could have stopped there, or they could even have tried to storm um, the ridge for each hex, which is worth two victory points. Eliminating uh, an opposing unit is worth one, two or three victory points, depending. And uh, the winner is the one with the most victory points at the end of the game. So what's different about it that um, will uh, make you want to pick it up? One thing is um, that's not different, you know, but it's, it's a simple game and it plays very quickly. So you could probably play it in two or three hours. Um, maybe four at most if you need to read the rules first. I didn't read the rules through. Um, I sort of skimmed them and then uh, started playing, uh, uh, checking the rules as I went. And that was very um, worked very well, partly because I found no errata. There's, except for one essential point of errata, which is on Board Game Geek. I couldn't find this anywhere on Cotton Sim World. Um, oh no, this is something someone asked, some, an alternative... Um, entry, uh, turns of entry, which someone has printed out, but they, someone else is also on Board Game Geek, they've done a nice player aid card with all the charts on it. Otherwise you've got um, the combat results chart here and you have, the only other chart you need is the bombardment chart and that's at the back of the rules there. So it's all very simple, not too much to, to get at, but the uh, essential art uh, errata was um, before you punch out your counters, you're going to want to do something. So I'll quickly show you. And it, in fact, this errata is included in the magazine. Yeah, that was the thing. That's why it wasn't a problem. But you see on the Union counter, the blue one there, at the top, you can just faintly see... Uh, sorry, 
probably won't be able to get this in focus with my hand wobbling. There's um, a number there in white on the top right. The, so the numbers were in white on that pale grey on the Confederates. You couldn't see them and some were quite misaligned. None were misaligned on my union. So they were all on the counters, even when I clipped corners. But you're going to need to either record them before you um, take. And it's simply just, you know, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as you go along the sprue. But you're going to need them on the... Um, confederate ones listed or ha or, or um, make a note of which corps and which brigade these units are from because um, the it being Gettysburg a meeting engagement you have units coming on at certain times and on the turn track it's just listed num confederate numbers 9 to 13 Numbers 14 to 15, 16 to 27, so forth. So unless you know what those numbers are, you're going to have trouble picking them out. Um, but So that wasn't a biggie. It you know, just took me five minutes to sort that out. Um, and as I said, it came with the magazine. It came in, included in a, a mini insert. So um, 20 movement points, hey, and 28. And the interesting thing is you have three types of movement. Road movement, whereas one movement point per hex. So when the uh, Confederates come on, obviously the game starts with Buford's cavalry. And uh, I was a bit um, intrigued by that because I thought, and I could be wrong, but often in Confederate and in Gettysburg games, Buford's cavalry can start up along Hare Ridge here. Um in this game, they start up around here and here, so essentially around Seminary Ridge, McPherson's Ridge, and the Railroad Cut. So I guess I'm wrong, but um, perhaps in other um, Gettysburg games, you have an option, maybe that if they get the first turn, the Union can move straight up. But no, here the Confederates get the first turn, and they can move straight on up, except you cannot move on road movement within um, eight hexes of an artillery piece. and Buford's guys start with one artillery counter, so one battery, I guess. So if they, if they say start, say here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it has to be in line of sight. And as I say, it's very simple in this game. Um, so you could go one movement point along the roads here, and after that, it's two movement points in any hex. So no worrying about terrain effects, charts, upslopes, downslopes, etc. So from there, then two movement points onwards. And then when you get within three hexes of any unit, so infantry, cavalry, or artillery, it's four movement points per hex. And finally, you can only enter the zone of control and therefore fight um, a unit by melee combat if you spend four movement points per hex your whole turn. So really you're looking at four modes of movement. One is road, one is the normal two movement points per hex, which immediately cuts you down to say standard movement for an infantry unit is 10 hexes. Double that on the road. If you enter three hexes as soon as you start getting closer to another unit, it's four movement points each. Um, and then the last, so, so you could say spend some on the road, uh, say 10 points on the road, four more points in over streams in the woods, so that's eight more movement points. So that leaves you two movement points left. You wouldn't be able to enter within three hexes if you had four, or if you're cavalry, you could do two more hexes in, in, in that three hex range. And if you want to um, go into melee combat, you essentially you have uh, f you can move five hexes as an infantry unit or seven hexes as cavalry. So those are your options. And what they've said about this game is that they've folded operational and tactical together. So you kind of have that operational movement capability, but then you have some uh, tactical, um, I'm not going to say complexities or intricacies, but some tactical, because it's not a complicated game, considerations um, when you get into the hex and hex combat. Um, so that's movement. So within a player turn, um, you start with the movement, then you have bombardment phase. Now that is normal. Um, you have the ranges. Um, the interesting thing and fairly standard is that you can only disorganize a counter. So that means you flip it and uh, typically um, they will have less combat value and less morale value once flipped. Um, well, not typically, but all the time. 
Um, and oh, I should mention stacking is two units per hex and one artillery uh, or three artillery per hex. And sometimes you might want three artillery in a hex because then all, they can all potentially all bombard on, on certain considerations together. Otherwise, artillery bombard separately and you can't bombard the same hex twice. So you have to be careful and think careful about how you're sighting your artillery. Um, then uh, an interesting thing with that is, um, let's zoom in, sorry, I'm going to have to keep remembering when I just focus, aren't I? Let's just have a look at this end situation here. So um, we have Union Artillery here and um, CSA Artillery here. Say these bombard, it's their bombardment phase and they're bombarding this unit, then um, Union artillery can then counter bombard only if you are bombarding, then they can counter bombard, and that's very simply handled in that you've got three artillery units here and they send three artillery to bombard. That means you start on the zero hex of the bombardment table. Normally, at range, you have two points per, per counter. So, say if you have um, three counters bombarding, that's six points, and only one counter bombarding, then you have four points on the bombardment table. And the bombardment table, um, say four points, you roll a d6, and then this number is what you um, add or subtract from the morale. So um, say I, I had a two result, this unit would have to roll below five morale on d6 um, to remain unflipped, and uh, I would add two to that die roll. Um, so that's the bombardment, and that's very simple. And then uh, the last twist is that um, any of the units that didn't counter bombard of your opposing player, if you have your units adjacent to theirs, then they can bombard you. So that gives it an opportunity for its kind of like opportunity fire as a, a, a unit moves up. Because another consideration in that in that they folded tactical and operational together in this is that. Um, if, say, you move in front of your artillery units, normally that would cause some problem with line of sight. But if you've done it in that turn, then your artillery unit can fire straight through it so you weren't there. Even though the bombardment phase is after movement, you just say, well, you know, we were moving as they, we fired as they moved up. Then you uh, go to the combat phase. Now, again, this is interesting. Say we have... Um, situation like this, we've got some artillery up on the ridge there, infantry down below, and these move up to engage. Now immediately the artillery have a chance to retreat two hexes, so your artillery are not going to be um, left vulnerable to you know huge movements onto them. They can retreat two hexes away. If they were the only ones there, then your opponent could move in. But, so, the artillery say retreat. If they decide to stay, they will be flipped, and so they now have what's called canister fire. So, anybody who bombards in the, in the turn previously flips anyway, and um, can still do canister fire, and essentially that just adds four um, points to the combat strength of the infantry units that are being meleeed. Now, the other thing about melee um, that's a bit different is you have uh, stacking is two, but only the top unit can fight, and you fight the top unit in the other hex. So that is a consideration. Unless, for example, I have two uh, different hexes attacking, then both the units in here, one will defend against that, one will defend against that, but it will all be combined in one attack. So normally you defend with just a top unit, if you have, if you're attacking from just one stack, or even with more, but anyway, if you have two units in a hex, the, the one underneath can support. But you have to consider that as well, because then he might, um, uh, hit that, that he, there's a certain chance of him getting a penalty. Uh, there's, there's more chance of the supporting unit get, getting a penalty as well as the attacking unit. So you have to make that kind of consideration. So after the fight, say, okay, um, you have, you, it's differential and it, it goes from minus seven to plus 10 and um, the terrain and so forth effects are very small and easy. So it's basically plus two for woods, town, higher level, sunken road, plus three for breastworks. And then if you have two direction attacks, 
So, you know, if I'm, oops, sorry, if I'm the attacker, that's a two direction attack. I get plus two. If I have three, not some other units here, three directional attack, that wouldn't really happen because he would have to fight, these would have to be included. But anyway, um, three directional attack, then um, uh, plus three. Uh, and then plus three if, if you have a supporting unit um, underneath. So then you, you roll a d6. So again, it's very nice and simple. It just has a differential. The modifiers are to the differential, not to the d6. And then you read the result. And the results are either disordered, um, route, which means they are disordered and they retreat two hexes. Disordered means you flip them and break. And break means they're taken off the board and they go into a box they forgot to add. You can I just wrote it here. Available for reorganization. Um, then the, the slight twist is that some results mean that the supporting unit takes a hit and the um, and the, the, the uh, on top unit will take a break. Um, if you break, in fact, all of the units, unless it's that special one, if a standard break, all of the units, so both the supporting and the non-supporting go. And any um, on any result, except for no result, artillery will be eliminated. So you have to be careful about leaving your artillery in the front line. They, you can use them for that last-minute canister blast, but it's very risky. If it's a high-odds attack against you, um, then... You can see um, no result, no result. So it's attacker, defender, result. Uh, it's not going to happen much often at all, but only at the extreme ends. And that's another interesting thing about it, is that even at extreme odds, um, I can't go down any lower. Um, but anyway, so we've got extreme odds plus 10, so that's great for the attacker. Um, you can still have this, which is the, the supporter routes and the top guy breaks. There, the supporter routes and the top guy um, disrupts. So you can still have quite bad results. So a break is that the unit is removed, goes to reorganization. You can still have quite a bad result, um, even as a, a, a very high odds attacker. So, you know, attacks not... Um, it's not just a kind of like a progressive, um, you know, with some CRTs where you have, um, you can see eliminations start here and then they get progressively less likely. And for the attacker there, elimination will never happen at high odds. It, it's going to happen. In, it can happen here. And, and also, same down there, even as a defender, you can get, well, not quite as bad. So... It's a bit slightly favourable to the defender, slightly more risky for the attacker. Um, so, yes, so then say the combat result was that, let's just say for the sake of it, the top unit of both sides um, either disrupted or broke. Well, let's say we got, uh, let's see what, let's be realistic, we can have a break and disruption. So say the, um, the, the attacker broke, so I've removed him for reorganisation, and the defender um, got a disorganised. Yes. Okay. Then um, what happens is now uh, the defender has a chance to withdraw. They might say, oh, no, you've weakened me quite a lot. I think you're going to try to attack again. I'm going to withdraw one or two hexes. And then the attacker can advance one hex into the vacated hex. If the defender doesn't withdraw, the attacker can withdraw. And again, they might want to do that because if you stay in contact, you will have to fight again. So the defender could withdraw one hex and the attacker advances one hex. They have to fight again. You might do that if you have some other units around because now the attacker will have to fight those extra units. You can draw them in like that. But um, so if you withdraw one hex and the attacker says, I don't want to be drawn in, they can withdraw. Otherwise, um, you're mandated to advance, um, pursue as they call it, against the retreating foe. Um, and so um, the combat potentially could keep going. You could keep fighting as long as one you, or both sides don't decide to withdraw from that fight and pull out. Then you go to the rally phase, and in the rally phase, um, your artillery flip back. So if they had fired, they can bombard again. Um, 
disorganize infantry and cavalry are flipped back and then you have to go to reorganization now reorganization is this so that say these are all the csa losses on that last penultimate turn last but one you take them up and you find out which ones are in the same unit and you have a track here so heths are together penders johnsons rose etc and in, in, for the union it's the first core the 11th corps the 12th corps the reserve etc and um you find so so you say okay these guys are both heths and these three are impenders then what you have to do is you pair them up and one of them is permanently eliminated and it's always it's always the stronger one then the other one goes back on the board five hexes away from an enemy uh, as close as possible to one of his units and the same for these others so um say these are two of pen these are all penders okay that one of the strongest has to go and you have to do this there's no option the other one will go on the board and um there's one left over so he goes back to reorganization so you can at the end you can only ever have one unit in reorganization there from any um formation you could have several formations waiting for reorganization now this is important because a you get some units back and b each um organization has as i said a little track here for example path Heth <laughs> has one, two, three um, slots. Pender has only two. Johnson has only two. So uh, once three of those or two of those, however many slots are filled, that formation is demoralized. From then on, you can, when your units flip, they cannot flip back on the rally phase. And um, they cannot enter enemy zones of control. And they cannot advance after combat or pursue. Um, disorders units can enter enemy zones of control, so you can fight with them, but obviously, um, you know, they have a greater chance of being lost off the board. So there's a few more uh, little wrinkles that I haven't mentioned, but essentially that's what it is. Then you go to the USA player phase, and he repeats the same thing. So, um, that's the game. I don't think I need to say any more about it. It's interesting that someone's produced a different um, reinforcement schedule you've got the um roads so you've got e d e and f so i guess that's baltimore pike emmitsburg road and the other one here and um the uh as always the uh, confederates can come on here here or a few of them come on here the confederates have an optional um section of uh, cavalry obviously didn't arrive at the actual battle if they take them i didn't that's victory points to the union for that um and that is the game in a nutshell i um enjoyed it, it i was going to say i really enjoyed it it's uh, games like this it's going to depend on your mood slightly because um, you can see they don't grab your attention you have things like this demoralization track there's nothing really that jumps out to say this formations demoralized you know if it was today the last box would be a bright red or something like that so at a glance i just immediately see oh he's finished well there'd at least be like a heavily underlined so i know we're at the end so you know it's that that um the oldie style of it's it's basic and it's functional it does the job exceedingly well but it doesn't kind of go that extra step to help you more that we are able to do with our greater graphics capability today again with the counters um uh, you don't actually have to apart from the reorganization you don't have to worry about um, mixing brigades up and so forth um i'm a little unclear i've forgotten if these each counter represents brigade i think that's the case because they all have the name of a commander on them so you know pender's got um I don't know, maybe seven brigades. So he's got a couple of divisions in there. And um, so there's on one side, you've got the divisional commander. Um, so we've got Rhodes and then the other side, the brigade. And so Rhodes is, this is a, no, that's a division, isn't it? Right, anyway, I always get confused because they use don't they, different um, modes of organising their troops. But anyway, you get the picture. So the command control is not an issue. It's the operational. Um, the command control is important in this. So, for example, I had at the end, at this point, we had um, Rhodes was uh, demoralised and 
the I think it was the 12th Corps and the Union side were completely demoralized. So their units were kind of very fragile. And um, it was interesting to see, you know, I had to pull them out. I couldn't, I wasn't sending them forward as I was the others. Uh, the, the, the Confederates are very interesting because they have to press forward. Um, the, you know, the Union were steadily pushed back. If, if reinforcements kept flooding and I didn't play quite as well as I might have with them because I often am biased towards the attacker because I always think they're going to have a harder job. But I actually think in this game, the um, the it's going to be a hard job for both sides. I should have tried a bit harder for the Union. But, you know, I was learning the game as well. So learning the system because that... The combat system, the way you can take retreats, you can decide to stand or withdraw, means, you know, you can give ground, but you, it, 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 with the movement rates, you can give quite a lot of ground. And what I was tending to do was to stack units together because I thought, okay, if someone's going to attack that stack, it's going to be harder. But it doesn't really matter because you're not stacking nine and nine, you're not attacking nine and nine, 18 strength points. From one side, you're only attacking nine strength points. The other guy is just kind of like a backstop. Um, uh, so I should, next time I do it, I would spread the union out more because then, you know, I might be able to attack just one with one of my pieces, but from here I'd have to attack both. But either way, it's not going to be so easy to dance around as the Confederates were able to do somewhat. Um, if I have my units spread out more. I thought it was going to be fragile, but I, I think it's nicely factored in, and that's not necessarily going to be the case. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure, um, but I would like to play the game again. I would recommend it. I think you've got um, north facing this way. I think it's supposed to face that way, isn't it? But maybe all Gettysburg maps are different. I don't remember. So, um, yeah. Very interesting because um, with the operational flavor movement, you you are concerned in your operational um, gesture. So you know you're more concerned in the bigger picture about where your thrusts are, who you're bringing up to support um, your main attacks and so forth, rather than having to go through all that tactical. Um, what not of counting every single movement point as you go up and down slopes and making sure all your units are moving together on a f uh, even front and so forth. But then when you got into the fighting, it wasn't just a simple odd base CRT, add up all the factors in each step. So you had to think a little bit more about that. There was a little bit of thought and consideration in the bombardment and um, if you're going to leave your artillery to maybe get destroyed but be able to add in a canister factor and so forth so um i liked that attempt at blending obviously i'd have to play it more to say if it really succeeds on game balance but as a game system um i thought it's perfectly viable it's very um um easily enterable uh easily playable and um yeah, a good thumbs up from me for this one.